afternoon and thanks for coming. Uh, this began because I was observing, by coincidence, uh, rates in uh, murder rates, in homicide rates for Colombia and uh, Venezuela, and they were going in, in opposite direction. In the in the eighties, nineties, uh, Colombia's murder rate was four or five times higher than in Venezuela, which in Venezuela actually traditionally from the sixties, seventies has been very low. And the states, uh, and then some place around the turn of the century. Uh, it has gone in the opposite direction. Now Venezuela's uh, 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 homicide rates are four times uh, uh, higher than, than Colombia. And uh, I thought that that may be an indication of something else. I, I was wondering if, if, if GDP per capita, economic performance, uh, political culture have been uh, some similar uh, reversals, or maybe not as, 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 not as, as noticeable. But some, so I thought that we had at Colombia the perfect person to answer that inquiry. So he's going to illuminate us on, on that, uh, resolve the conundrum. Uh, professor uh, Jose Ocampo he is a professor of uh, prof uh, professional practice at CIPA. He has written numerous books about Latin American uh, economies, also about economic history going back to the 19th century. So he, He's a fellow historian, a member, an official member of the guild. Uh, and he's proud of that, I think. <laughs> like most economists, and I think that adds something that most economists uh, sometimes uh, lack, that historical perspective. Uh, he was the uh, Minister of Finance in Colombia, the Minister of Agriculture, Finance and Credit, which I, is it similar to the uh, of the Fed? Is that like the chair of, chairman of the Fed, something like that? Is, no, no, no. It happens to chair the Central Bank of Board. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, also, at the United Nations, uh, the, uh, the Undersecretary of Social and Economic uh, <coughs> Development, and also has uh, had uh, uh, important uh, positions in the uh, ECLA, or CEPAL, the uh, Commission for Development of Latin America. Uh, so it is a pleasure and it is uh, an honor and, and let's welcome you. Uh, I mean, fortunately, uh, Jose didn't tell me uh, his divergence in what period. <laughs> <laughs> right? I said the, the post World War II period. <laughs> 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 Uh, and I, I forgot to mention that actually in the uh, 70s or 80s, uh, about 2 million Venezuelans migrated to Colombia. No, uh, Colombia is right. Colombia is yeah. yeah. to Venezuela, yeah. Okay. In any case, uh, I, as I happened to have written three years ago a, a, a paper called the, the Diverging Evolution of the Grand Colombian Economies, comparing Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador. Uh, how about Panama? Uh, yeah, Panama was part of Colombia, and, and then, uh, and then of course it became independent. Uh, but the you know, 19th century was part of Colombia. But uh, I should probably have written about Panama in the 20th century. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I, what I'm going to do is uh, actually uh, uh, go back to that paper, you know, so uh, look at long, really long-term trends, two centuries. Uh, you know, so what I'm going to do is uh, let me start with uh, uh, some reflections on on the early history. Uh, I'm talking about basically the late colonial period and the pennies and 19th century. Uh, then uh, 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 the, uh, the big pe one period of divergence, where you can say is in favor of Venezuela, uh, which is the period that, uh, of the oil expansion of Venezuela uh, from the 1920s to the 19. 60s, let's say, uh, you know, mid 70s, uh, and then the contemporary period, which, uh, as uh, as I will uh, show, really starts in the, in the late 1970s, which is in favor of Colombia. Okay. Uh, so the so the, so, and I'm going to use a few slides, but they, they are not uh, complete. It's not a, uh, but they do give a. a uh, you know, a sense of the uh, uh, of the differences, let's say, uh, you know, between 
to the evolution of the two countries. Okay. So uh, in, in, in my, my historical paper, I, I started by pointing out that there are three uh, big sources of this. <coughs> First of all, the, col the colonial inheritance. Uh, <coughs> uh, the second is the, the role uh, during the independence, uh, but particularly uh, the, uh, the very uh, uh, diverging evolution of the political institutions of the two countries from very early on. Uh, and, uh, and third, uh, of course, the, the uh, relation between, um, you know, as in all Latin American countries, with the different export expansions uh, and, and how they would reflect it uh, in, in the economic development more together, economic and social development. I'll show a few slides uh, about uh, uh, also human development, education, etc. Okay. So, uh, so if we start by uh, um, um, with history. Uh, um, let's say uh, this is uh, the only uh, data that you can show uh, for the very. Uh, uh, early divergence, uh, which is uh, this is export per capita, right? That most of the slides will be in Spanish, but I guess most of you or all of you understand Spanish. Yeah. So this is export per capita. Okay, so uh, you can see from the you know from the late independence, uh, uh, late colonial period, uh, uh, Venezuela had developed uh, 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 a very uh, uh, slave cotton plantations in the in the uh, near the uh, the Caribbean coast. Uh, and they also uh, were some of the uh, countries that benefited from the uh, from the spread uh, of coffee uh, <coughs> after the Haitian Revolution uh, of 1791, which is a major event in, uh, in many uh, in sugar is a major event in, in coffee and major event in indigo, so the three major uh, uh, exports of uh, of Haiti. Uh, so in the case of coffee, uh, for example. The big, uh, the big country that benefited from sugar was Cuba. The biggest spread of, uh, of the plantations in Cuba started after the Haitian Revolution. Uh, in, uh, in case of, uh, of coffee, you know, I guess initially uh, there were Brazil, uh, uh, Costa Rica, and Venezuela. And, and actually coffee entered into Colombia through Venezuela. So it's, uh, uh, so the, uh, uh, so the, uh, uh, so you, you had the, uh, the, the old cocoa slave plantations uh, uh, started to have the, the coffee uh, uh, plantations in, uh, in, 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 in uh, Venezuela, which would actually uh, become the major staple of the 19th century for Venezuela. Okay? Uh, so before, before point, let's say it was coffee. Uh, so you see that, you know, like in, this is the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, you can see that uh, Venezuela has uh, you know, two and a half you know, high levels of uh, per capita exports to Latin Okay. Now, the, um, uh, this shows also uh, the, um, uh, let, me, well, let me go back to that. The, so, so the, uh, in, in a sense, of, uh, uh, for example, Malcolm D's, uh, which actually writes uh, both Colombian and Venezuelan uh, history, Professor from Oxford University actually has pointed out that Venezuela was the main uh, agricultural uh, colony of the of the Spanish Empire. Uh, he of course uh, forgot that uh, at the end of the 18th century it was Cuba uh, that would be would be the uh, the main agricultural uh, economy of the Spanish Empire. Uh, so the uh, now. Uh, Venezuela, as opposed to Colombia, was not well structured in colonial times. Uh, uh, Colombia, Colombia, of course, was, uh, 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 was an audience, a uh, uh, place for the audience. And then the vice royalty uh, uh, first created in the 1720s, and in the soon, and then more stayed in the 1760s. Okay? So it was one, at the end, it was one of the four, four vice royalties of the uh, Spanish America, so it was a major, let's say, uh, a, a part of the, of the colonial. Uh, Venezuela, in contrast to that, uh, was also organized as a, a Capitania General, you know, which is a military government, really, uh, in Spanish times, mm -hmm. uh, in a relatively late colonial, uh, colonial. So it was not, it had no unity on the relatively late, in, uh, like 1760s or 1770s. Uh, so, that it so. so it's a big difference uh, uh, between, um, they, uh, uh, well, finally, they had some elements of common colonial. Uh, 
social structures, uh, slavery, of course, mm -hmm. much more important mm -hmm. in terms of Venezuela and Colombia. Uh, 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 but also, uh, very interestingly, uh, these uh, pockets of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, late uh, white migrants uh, from colonial times, uh, which settled in, the, in what is called the Venezuela Andes, which is actually the border with Colombia. Uh, so the structure in, in the part of Colombia, which is the being called Santander, uh, in honor of uh, the person I'm going to speak uh, about uh, in a few minutes. Uh, 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 that is uh, actually a very interestingly, uh, you know, uh, part of the of the settlements of white migrants, uh, 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 which were, you know, people of modest means. I mean, uh, they came late in the uh, colonial period, uh, and they, 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 they didn't have uh, lots, of, lots, of, lots of land, and certainly had no Indians, but very few slaves. Okay, Colombia is also Antioquia, uh, which is the other pocket of, of, of that uh, sort of migration. Okay. Okay. Uh, in contrast to that, Colombia, of course, has more uh, uh, surviving indigenous communities uh, and, uh, and mestizo population. Uh, so the uh, Venezuela was mulatos, uh, Colombia was more mestizos. But actually, a very balanced uh, uh, actually population uh, of Colombia, according to the history of road, is the most, the most balanced of all the uh, Spanish America in terms of the, the shares of uh, uh, let's say of Indians and Mestizo, uh, Blacks and uh, Whites. Okay. Now, independence, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, had uh, Venezuela as the, uh, and Bolivar, of course, as the main uh, leader. Uh, but uh, after a very, very uh, uh, complicated process, which in the, in the history of Venezuela is called the Guerra de Castas, you know, uh, basically, uh, actually, to some extent, promoted by the Spanish, uh, who also offered uh, were earlier uh, to offer freedom to the slaves who joined the army uh, uh, against the independence movement. And of course, uh, the independence army had to uh, do the same, uh, which of course had a, a, an important implication in which slavery was totally disorganized as a result of that. So uh, after the independence wars, uh, neither, uh, uh, I mean, the major, uh, let's say, uh, uh, export products of both colonies were totally disorganized. Uh, Coco in the Venezuela and gold in Colombia, uh, which was, uh, uh, particularly in the Pacific, was also a slave production. Um, uh, now, but more important than that, I think, uh, uh, and this is a point that I make in, my, in that paper that I mentioned, uh, is, uh, is what happened with the, um, with the political institutions that were inherited. I mean, one of the very, uh, uh, very peculiar development is that you know, three parts of the, of the same colonial unit, which are the Viceroy of the Unu Granada, uh, became, you know, were, had such different political histories, uh, which started very early on. Uh, Colombia, uh, you know, according to our history, because of the influence of uh, General Santander, <coughs> Paula Santander, who was the effective president, let's say, he was the vice president, but he was the effective president of, uh, of, the, of Colombia, uh, of Great Colombia, as it was Grand Colombia. Uh, uh, and that is uh, essential because, of course, Bolivar was fighting wars, you know, yes, in uh, Peru and Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru and Bolivia, right? So the effective president was Santander. And Santander, uh, uh, happened to have, you know, a very simple Republican view of government. Uh, in, the, in, in the economic history, it's called the, the, the man of the laws, the hombre de la ley. So the so he uh, he gave Colombia, in a sense, uh, a very a very important set of Republican institutions. Uh, in contrast to that, you know, after the dissolution, he was of course the first president, elected president of Colombia uh, after the breakdown of. of, of Okay. Venezuela uh, uh, had, of course, another general, uh, Paez, uh, as the first uh, major leader. Uh, and uh, although Paez, uh, according to Venezuelan history, was also a, a Republican, they say he started, in, he, he developed, or, or Venezuela developed under him, uh, this sense of you know, strong caudillos, you know, strong uh, uh, political leaders. Uh, and so the, the history, you know, uh, starts to diverge in a, in a very significant way. I mean, Colombia, 
uh, you know, for all these problems, uh, is the most stable Republican government in the Americas after the United States. I mean, Colombia has elected uh, all its presidents since independence, uh, except for two, uh, which only govern a very short period of time, you know. Uh, uh, the rest have been elected. So we have had uh, out of uh, more than 200 uh, years of history, only five years of non-elected governments. Uh, you know, in contrast to that, Venezuela uh, developed gradually a, a, a tradition of long uh, uh, dictatorships. And so it's a sequence of, uh, you can say, well, you know, Pius was not scripted, but then you have Antonio Guzman Blanco, Cipriano Castro, and especially Jose Vicente Gomez, uh, which was uh, in government for 36 years. And then uh, later on, of course, Pérez Menes, uh, which was the, the last, let's say, uh, dictator of uh, Venezuela. Um, so uh, this is a very interesting, why did it develop like that is a very interesting question. I mean, uh, one thing that is important in the history of Colombia, uh, I think, is, uh, is, a, is a mix of two things which are inter interrelated, actually, uh, which is the fact that we had a, a, a strong bipartisan system very early on, um, a, a, which had lots of local roots. Uh, so that, for example, Antioquia, which is very, very major re uh, region of Colombia, was conservative, continues to be conservative to the present. And that, uh, of course, uh, gave, uh, you know, the Santander, in contrast, for example, was always, uh, and, and the Caribbean were always liberal strongholds. Uh, and, and therefore, the, in a sense, the, the major consensus early on was that uh, among the re uh, regional elites, in a sense, is that the Republican institutions served them well, in terms of, uh, first of all, controlling Bogota, which nobody wanted uh, uh, in the regions uh, to be controlled by Bogota, on the one hand, so very weak <coughs> army because of that, uh, and uh, rather, you know, a tradition of respecting uh, uh, within the, you know, with very peculiar institution because at the same time there were civil wars uh, uh, of different character, but there were four <coughs> civil wars in general, except for the major civil war, which was the, you know, the history of the War of the Thousand Days in uh, 1899. In Venezuela, uh, of course, there were also civil wars, but a uh, 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 major civil war in the uh, in 60s. Uh, but the, the, the most important, in, in a sense, uh, was this tradition of, of strong leaders, uh, of, you know, in, you know many, many military parties. So the periods of Republican institutions are rather short, uh, certainly in the 19th century. Yeah. I mean, one thing that actually one today, they're looking at the statistics of elections, uh, and, uh, collected by, I don't know, I don't remember who. Actually, it was very interesting to, to know that they, before 1870, there were only four changes in government in Latin America uh, associated to elections from one party to another. <laughs> Two of them were in Colombia. Santander lost, the, or the Liberal Party lost the elections of 1837 and handed the power to the Conservatives who lost the elections of the 1849 and handed the power to the liberals. Very unusual for Latin American standards. Uh, so that, that established a tradition in which if you actually elect the governments and, and the opposition party won, and you handed the uh, power to the opposition, uh, which is very, was very, very unusual in Latin American history, which can say even up to the present. Uh, so I think this is, this is a, a very important difference uh, in the political institutions, which in a sense continue to the present. Now, I'll come back to that uh, uh, later on, okay? Now, none was very successful in the 19th century. I mean, uh, you can see that per capita is you know, in Venezuela, let's say it was uh, you know, five and ended in the century, uh, in the, this coffee boom of the late 19th century, with just a slightly eight, so it's was no growth. Uh, Colombia had actually a bit more, so it's a bit of convergence, but not too much. Colombia was also both were failures in the 19th century. Now, one interesting feature that uh, we'll see uh, was corrected later on is that in other aspects, Colombia was ahead. Uh, and this, is the, this is the human development of education uh, relative to developed countries that we developed for our so you can say that in the late 19th century, Colombia was well ahead of Venezuela. Uh, 
period, you know, what, uh, and, and I, 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 I think that the, uh, the, the turning point is actually the, uh, the end of the boom, uh, so the late 1970s, uh, and the, the big difference is shown here. You can see that Venezuela actually has not surpassed yet uh, the peak per capita <coughs> of 1977. So it's, a, it's basically a stagnation with, a, with very uh, strong business side. So the current recession is no exception. Uh, it's, it's not unique, let's say, in, in Venezuelan history of the last four decades. Uh, exactly the you know, pattern. So you have boom bust. Uh, uh, you see the, uh, the, the, you see the crisis in the 1980s, but you have also, well, you have this crisis uh, associated actually with the financial crisis. Uh, you have this, which uh, actually was, uh, this is the early part of the uh, Chavez administration. Is a, of course, collapse of commodity prices, but also the major strike in, in Pedevesa uh, of 2002, and then you have the current crisis. Okay, so uh, now, in contrast to that, Colombia is, is, is more steady process uh, with prices, yes. Uh, you have a, a slowdown in the debt crisis. Uh, this is the late uh, 20th century crisis, and this is the um, uh, 2008 international crisis, let's say. But very small. Uh, so it's more steady growth. Now this is a very peculiar feature of Colombia uh, by Latin American standards. Colombia has been the most stable uh, economy uh, in terms of growth. It's, uh, it's never had had huge booms, but never had had huge prices. <laughs> and, and I think that's the peculiarity of you know of Colombia. Uh, and actually, Venezuela stands as the exact opposite uh, of Colombia. You know, the economy with big crisis. Uh, and this is reflected in many other things that we'll see uh, uh, later on, but the, the, this is the, uh, the first one, uh, uh, which is the debt crisis uh, of the 19, uh, 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 the debt crisis. Well, it's very peculiar, you see that the settled debt of Colombia, uh, of course, increased uh, in 1980s, uh, seven, late 70s and 1980s, but most less than Venezuela. So Venezuela, uh, you know, uh, at the peak had uh, external debt levels, which were uh, uh, more than twice those of Colombia. Okay? Uh, this is very paradoxical. There is a lot of uh, writings uh, about why, uh, why, uh, why Venezuela uh, uh, accumulated a huge external debt at the time of the peak, uh, the uh, highest uh, oil prices <laughs> in history. Okay? And, um, it's, uh, and the, the basic reason, uh, as the uh, shows, is, uh, is uh, capital. So the you know, uh, late 1970s is capital applied for Venezuela in large amounts. So this debt is really uh, a private sector money in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and it's part of the sale of this particular tradition. Uh, uh, so of course this cap private capital money of Colombia is also in the United States, but not of the same magnitude uh, as the, that uh, of Venezuela. And the, and the contrast here in the early 1980s uh, would be uh, but you know, you will see we'll see the inflation later on uh, in my graphs. But uh, let me also say that the uh, uh, that the, uh, uh, the the financial crisis. Uh, Colombia had two financial crises: uh, one in uh, in the early 1980s and one in the late 1990s. But they were relatively small. Uh, you know, they costed let's say five percent of GDP, which is a small price in the national standards. The Venezuelan crisis of 1994-1997 costed, uh, uh, according to the international estimates, about 15% of GDP. So the crisis will all be more intense, in, in, as I said, in GDP terms, in debt terms, uh, and, and we will see a lot. And, and also, they were all more costly in social terms. Okay? Although inequality in Venezuela has only been lower than Colombia. Anyway, so Colombia remains one of the most unequal uh, 
countries of Latin America. Uh, in poverty terms, you can see that in 1980, uh, Venezuela was, Colombia was well, uh, more poorer uh, than, uh, than Venezuela, actually. Uh, but uh, look at the Venezuelan numbers. They went, they went up from 25% uh, of poverty to uh, 48%. Okay? So the, the crisis of Venezuela, uh, this early crisis, so, so let me put it this way. Uh, uh, Chavez was the end of this process, not the beginning. Okay? So Chavez came after two decades uh, of uh, the rising poverty in Venezuela and economic crisis in Venezuela. Okay? Uh, you can say, well, uh, you know, he may have worsened things. Uh, I'll come back to that. But you know, uh, so the Venezuelan, uh, the Venezuelan structural issues uh, go back to the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, they don't begin uh, with chance. Uh, so the, I mean, it's no accident that, uh, I mean, as you know very well, the, this led to the Caracaso of 1989, uh, led to the uh, attempted coup by Chavez in 1992, uh, and uh, finally uh, the his electoral victory in 1999. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, but this is after two decades, let's say, <coughs> of uh, increasing problems In any case, Venezuela has remained uh, uh, much more equal than Colombia. This is, well, I cannot go into this, is the human development indicators and also my inequality, uh, whatever you take, uh, education, life expectancy, or, or even uh, particularly income. Uh, you know, Venezuela is a less unequal society than Colombia. Uh, I mean, up, up to the present, our economy has uh, gradually improved. Uh, it has improved, you know, following the trends of Latin America. But Venezuela was already uh, <coughs> much, uh, less unequal, let's say, uh, 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 you know, uh, before than the whole. Okay. Now, uh, uh, two things, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll finish. Um, uh, the, the, the political issues, I mean, the, the divergence in political terms, let's say. Um, so you can say that you know this process or, or this democratic transition that had been common uh, in the late 1950s uh, ends up in a totally different system in the early 21st century. Uh, Venezuela ends up with a very polarized uh, political system, but no violence. Okay. Okay. It's uh, very interesting. I mean, aside from the Caracaso, the same. And, the, and of course the, the coup attempts, let's say, in 1992, and then the, the, the attempt of the coup against Chavez in 2002. Uh, you know, uh, Venezuela does remain. I mean, it's amazing that it has violence in uh, social terms, but no political violence uh, that Colombia has, or extensively has. Now, in contrast to that, Colombia ends up with a, a you can say, a reinforced Republican system. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that goes back to its own history, uh, but you know, uh, attempts to open up, uh, and attempts to open up uh, both uh, through more open elections and uh, more open political processes, but also with negotiations uh, with the uh, with the guerrillas. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, and, well, the ongoing negotiations with FARC, but there were two previous attempts. Uh, but particularly the successful negotiations uh, of the uh, of the late uh, 1980s with the M19, with the Quintin Lame, uh, with the Ejército uh, Popular de Liberación, uh, you know, uh, with the M19 of course being the most important and entering the political process, uh, particularly for the Constitutional Assembly of 1991, in which the head of M19 was in equal terms uh, with the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party <coughs> sharing the presidency of the constitutional assembly. Uh, and now, of course, the attempt to, to negotiate. So it's, it's a system that uh, continues with the Republican tradition. And, and I guess the greatest contrast uh, of all is, of course, in the, in the division of powers. Uh, Colombia uh, continues to have a deep respect for the division of, of powers. So uh, particularly for the, the, the uh, uh, let's say, the independence of the judicial system. Uh, as one of the uh, cornerstones, let's say, of the division's powerful powers. Uh, Venezuela, in contrast to that, uh, as, as it is 
Song Gao is in there. Although it respects the electoral, electoral results, uh, both the defeat of Chavez in the, in the referendum of 1997, uh, uh, which he was defeated in the attempt to change the, the, uh, the Constitution to allow him for, to be reelected for life, the same. Uh, uh, but also for the, uh, the victories of the opposition in, uh, in mayoral and governorships uh, races, uh, and also for the uh, victory uh, in the elections uh, in last year. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that has yet to be reflected, uh, as it is in Colombia, in a well-functioning division of powers, uh, which in Colombia works, you know, we can say relatively well. I mean, so much so that let's say that the Constitutional Court is the one that turned down the re-election of President Uribe, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the attempt by the President to, you know, to be reelected you know, several times. Uh, so in, uh, in, in political terms, uh, uh, what was a period of convergence, let's say from 1950s, has ended up you know, in another di big divergence, uh, uh, which uh, we have to see how it, 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 it ends up, uh, both in Colombia and in Venezuela. Of course, uh, you know, Colombia, for the peace negotiations uh, succeed, and, and what political system it developed after that. I mean, the, the previous attempts were not, uh, with far, were not very successful, let's say, uh, uh, particularly because of the killing of uh, many uh, leaders of the Union <coughs> Patriotic, which was the political party created by the party in the negotiations of the 1980s. Uh, but they, you know, uh, whether they uh, end up somewhere, uh, you know, dismantling the, the political uh, impasses, let's say, uh, that Venezuela is currently facing. Now, in, uh, in economic terms, I think that the, the situation, of course, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is quite diverging, not only because of what we saw, you know, the, this uh, divergence in growth rates, but also the uh, the building up a, of, a, a, of a huge political, <coughs> a huge economic crisis in Venezuela, which is going on, which is of course by far the worst economic crisis going on in Latin America. I will show three num a set of numbers. Uh, this is the foreign exchange reserves of the two countries, okay? So this is Colombia in blue, Venezuela. So in 2007, 2008, Venezuela ahead, and then it continues Reduction in uh, exchange, uh, foreign exchange reserves, Colombia with uh, a constant improvement. Okay, inflation. I mean, this is problem now. You know, as you have, you know, you have seen the press, in the discussion whether actually Venezuela. You know, you, you see the debt. I could not do this, uh, the same debt with debt. Uh, this graph, simply because the numbers for Venezuela recently are not available, uh, and as many other numbers. I mean, Venezuela has a stop policy in certain statistics. So it's, it's hard to, to follow some specific events, but it's quite clear that the debt issue, uh, which in the case of Venezuela now is a very interesting primarily with China, uh, and whether, you know, what is going to happen with that, whether it's going to be a default, I mean, the biggest rumors of defaults are in that the American debt is now in Venezuela. So the, the counterpart to this is actually rising for external debt for Venezuela in numbers that we don't quite know. This is inflation. You said this is the, yeah. the peak of inflation in 2015, over you know 100 percent. But to be clear, again, this happened before Charles took. <laughs> okay. In, in constant life, Colombia, with you know you know moderate inflation that you know goes into one digit levels, uh, you know since the uh, early 20th century. So it's a recurrent problem of, of, of inflation, of very high inflation now, so this is by far for the highest uh, inflation in America, probably the world today. Uh, you know, I mean, it has one advantage where Argentina, it doesn't cheat uh, <laughs> on the numbers, right? It informs the numbers. I mean, uh, it has to stop informing on the numbers, but actually inflation is important. Say, so I remember Argentina stopped, you know, they started to manipulate inflation the numbers of Argentina are 25, 30 percent. Uh, Venezuela is 150, 160 percent uh, inflation. And, and, and as 
table that there is a huge distortion uh, associated with the controls uh, of foreign exchange to, to manage this problem. Uh, uh, and also the, the, the price controls of several goods which are there the problem of scarcity, uh, which has become worse now, uh, but it was already acute when oil prices were at $100 per, per barrel. So, it's, so the problem is not of the crisis, it happened before the crisis. Uh, so the, uh, and finally, uh, and perhaps more problematic, this issue, uh, which is the, uh, the, the trends in living standards between the two countries. Uh, this is the, uh, the average income of the active population in terms of the number of poverty lines of each country. Uh, you can see that, you know, Colombia has you know, gradually progressed and it was a big uh, reversal in the late 1990s, but has actually increased. If I look at the story of Venezuela, it's a story of a long-term trend that was declining uh, in our uh, labor in terms of, uh, uh, you know, so they, they say in the early 1990s, they were, you know, you know, about, you know, almost five times the per capita income. Now, uh, they are three and a half. Uh, so the, uh, so in every dimension that you look at, the, uh, uh, you know, it's quite clear that the, the both countries face with the same origin, which is the collapse of oil prices. Uh, and I said, both because Colombia, before the crisis, was already 50% of oil exports. So it's in the same source, uh, the capacity uh, of Colombia to manage the crisis is much higher uh, because of the, you know, uh, there's a more resilient economic structure uh, that has developed, and uh, uh, in consequence of that, you know, not the intervention is in as far as we can say it has certain values, but the type of interventions in Venezuela that have actually generated lots of things. Now the, uh, the Maduro administration now is adopting some adjustment policies, uh, massive adjustments, uh, policies, but it's still are uh, clearly insufficient by the uh, by the needs uh, of, of an economy that has to go, you know, clearly uh, Say the weakest economy uh, of Latin America at the best. Thank you. Very illuminating, and like a good historian, seeing the long durée, right? So, what I thought was more recent developments actually have a deeper roots. That's like, that was actually quite interesting. I would say actually that uh, besides Colombia, uh, Chile from 1830. Um, 1930s, but so up, up to today, as we may have had only two military programs. Chile. Two or three, right? I mean, between yeah. Ocean and yeah. Foreign Law. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that was what yeah. we were going to say. Long. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was a very long time. I mean, Rosa Castilla was four years. But in 1870, let me see, Chile had changed governments, the party, right? 1848, in 50, and so on. Uh, the other thing that was interesting actually to see this inequality, uh, levels of inequality, is there are significant variances within countries, right? There is Merida compared to some other place, or Antioquia compared to Chocó, right? So, so if the social structures, the difference between social structures within each country are. You, you know, I, I have not seen a comparison of that sort. Uh, I remember an old estimate of uh, Colombia uh, like 30 years ago, uh, which actually showed that in, in those terms, Colombia is not very unequal. We think in terms so of it's, it's actually, uh, you can say, uh, you know, the Branko Milanovic, among other things, has done a comparison of the US and European income distribution. And, uh, you know, European, uh, uh, you know, European unions hold. And uh, the very interesting, uh, uh, conclusion is that, the, for example, that the U.S. is more unequal within each state than Europe is unequal within each country. But the inter-regional inequalities in the U.S. are much lower than they are in Europe. So the, the total uh, Gini coefficient of Europe, the estimate is very similar to that of the United States for, for European Union as a country. So it has the rich countries and poor countries in the U.S. The big differences are not uh, as, as high. Mm -hmm. you know, I, 
guess with the exception of Puerto Rico, which, <laughs> which is much lower. Do you think that was more than, I mean, you mentioned besides uh, elections, also the independence of the court and the division of power. I was wondering if uh, the other the other indicator that I was thinking of is freedom of the press, and I think this freedom counts or something like that may have uh, ranks or in indices of freedom of the press for several decades now. Uh, maybe I have to look at that. Yeah, see that. But uh, I'm sure that I don't want to monopolize this. I'm sure there is plenty of comments and yeah. Uh, very simple question, but uh, might take, uh, it might be also a difficult one. Uh, what went wrong uh, in, in, uh, in, in Venezuela uh, is who, who is, is, are there like Americans love to uh, categorize the good guys and the bad guys? Uh, uh, is, was it a clear example that uh, there is no escape from uh, Capitalism and, and following uh, uh, the, 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 the particularly for a country as tight as, as Venezuela has been to the U.S., it was uh, uh, shooting uh, uh, its own its own feet. But also somehow uh, the, the the issue of the fleeing not just of capital but of of, uh, of uh, skill uh, uh, professionals. Uh, do you think that that has impacted the the the, 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 the fall of, of the economic indicators? Well, again, there are only issues, addressing issues in Venezuela because uh, you see, for example, the mobility of capital to the U.S. is much worse than Colombia, and but it's uh, an issue going back to at least the 1970s. Uh, so it's. Uh, you can say, well, yeah, capital has flown out of Venezuela in this year. Yes, it has been for 15 years. Okay. So they, they, uh, so I'm not totally sure that that's a different. In human capital, I'm not sure either. Uh, I mean, Colombia has more migration, out of migration than Venezuela, <laughs> historically. Uh, so maybe you should accuse also the two of us from being here, right there in Colombia, okay? <laughs> So it's not clear that uh, it's worse. I mean, I think the uh, one difference, uh, uh, I mean, another thing that is, again, persistent is, uh, you know, which is, has to do with this strong business cycles of Venezuela, uh, is the fact that, uh, uh, you know, Venezuela, I, uh, this is a point that I have developed in some papers, it has the most procyclical policies of all of Latin America. So the tendency to, uh, when there is a, a revenue boom to spend it or overspend it, uh, and then when the crisis comes, uh, it has no money to, to sustain uh, spending. Okay? Uh, so the, this is a, Colombia, uh, it's worse today than it, it was in the past, but it's still, you know, uh, it's not as pro cyclical and, and sometimes it's counter cyclical uh, in this macroeconomic policy. But again, this is an old problem. The worst being actually for the 1970s, 90, you know, late 1970s, early 1980s in Venezuela, which is one of the most absurd uh, uh, cycles uh, in Latin American history. Also, you know, uh, you know, like in the oil boom, uh, but there's Mexico also, but the, uh, Mexico also had the same problem actually, actually very similar problems to Venezuela. You know. An oil boom, you know, huge investment levels, uh, and then the reduction. Uh, an increasing external debt that collapses in the early 1980s. It's actually similar, both with oil books. Yeah, uh, although the proportion of the Mexican economy that is made up by oil is small compared to the Yeah, but in the terms of the boom uh, of the second half of the 1970s in Mexico, it was oil led also. Uh, so, the, so, so those are oil patterns. Uh, I mean, what has been different uh, recently is the I think it's the major distortions uh, generated by the uh, uh, by the uh, intervention policies, uh, and, and it's not necessarily that you do interventions. For example, you know, you know, foreign exchange controls. Foreign exchange controls uh, were, you know, widespread in Latin America in the past. Uh, Colombia actually had one of the most extensive systems of exchange control uh, until the early 1990s. 
Uh, but but never generated the amount of uh, uh, distortion that the Venezuelan system uh, has generated uh, in terms of the, you know, the foreign exchange market. Again, price controls. You know, price control you have in many places in many Latin American countries at the same time, but the magnitude of or the price controls that, uh, or the distortion generated by price controls in Venezuela is probably one of the worst in Latin American history. So the, you know, so the distortions uh, generated by the interventions are, uh, you know, probably the worst in Latin American history. I, 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 I've been thinking of another case, and the only that comes to my mind uh, is actually the, uh, the, the crisis at the, at the end of the agenda period in Chile, mm -hmm. uh, which there were also extensive problems of the scarcity and price distortions. But the, um, uh, and they say uh, Venezuela is, is probably worse that regard and Chile was at the end of the ese apego a la ley eh, Colombia tiene una historia terrible política 50 años de, de lucha armada que Dios quiera se acabe pronto pues ha tenido de sangre esa nación y, la, y desde el punto de vista de calidad de vida nosotros hemos acogido a casi 4 millones de, de colombianos que han, que han huido del país por la terrible circunstancia política pero esa terrible circunstancia política no es solo por ese tema de la guerrilla, sino porque las élites colombianas no le dieron la participación política a esta gente y las salidas políticas como para asumir desde la política otro espacio, que yo creo que en el caso nuestro, Acción Democrática en el año 45 abrió las puertas para anchar y ampliar las clases medias en Venezuela y recibir a un sinnúmero de inmigrantes que hizo una nación muy plural. Muy plural y muy heterogénea. Yo creo que hacia adelante el gran desafío que tenemos como nación es integrar a esas, a esas capas de la población que son hoy las más amplias en unos sistemas políticos que tenemos que redefinirlo, que no están definidos, porque no, por el capitalismo pues ha, ha demostrado que no es el, el espacio para que esas circunstancias se den. Y el socialismo, pues en Venezuela ha demostrado que, bueno, y en el mundo entero ha demostrado que tampoco es el, el espacio. Yo siento profundamente, yo me siento profundamente optimista frente a mi país por dos razones. Primero, la capacidad de creatividad de, la, de Venezuela. Yo creo que esa diversidad nos dio una capacidad de creatividad enorme. Y que en el siglo XIX se mostró con ese crecimiento del sector agrícola y esas formas de crecer en un sector que era totalmente difícil, pues siendo una capitanía general, teniendo todos los problemas de, de inversión que teníamos, pues logramos ese, ese nivel de inversión, después de la petrolera, bueno, demostramos una, unas capacidades inmensas de hacer eh, una riqueza enorme y convertirnos en una potencia. Y yo creo que el gran desafío del de siglo XXI para Venezuela es, es la creatividad y apoyarnos en esta diversidad que, 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 que es parte de nuestra, de nuestra genética, por esa apertura que hemos tenido tanto en la política como en, en el recibir una corriente de inmigrantes tremenda. Nosotros a partir de los años 50 somos una nación absolutamente distinta, porque recibimos prácticamente un tercio de nuestra población fue gente que vino de la guerra en Europa y que nos hizo una, una, un país absolutamente diverso. La proporción de migrantes no es tan alta, ¿no? Eso es, es, es alto, pero no tan alta. Está comparado con la, la proporción de Uruguay, migrantes a, a Uruguay o Argentina en particular. Eh, digamos, Venezuela obviamente tuvo el, de los mayores flujos migratorios eh, de América Latina, ¿no? qué sé yo, los eh, 50 y 60, ¿no? 
eh, y después en, el, en los 70 pues, yo mucho por el colombiano, aunque la colombia colombiana hizo más por razones económicas que políticas, en el caso de, de la migración a Venezuela, y hay una mucha discusión sobre la cifra, la magnitud de los números, o sea, los números oficiales son bastante menos que 4 millones de colombianos en Venezuela. Eh, no podríamos hasta leer el gobierno en Venezuela, pero... Bueno, el presidente es colombiano. No somos ciudadanos. No, ciudadano. no, ya no son ciudadanos. Ya lleva mucho tiempo porque la, la migración de los años es un año de tema. Es una migración ya, ya de vieja edad. Eh, más bien ha habido un poco de retorno. Es cierto, la, digamos, los dos sistemas políticos están en, eh, en, en una situación. Claro, las virtudes y efectos, digamos, ¿eh? como digo, el, uno puede decir que de, la virtud de Colombia es, es su tradición republicana y de división de poderes, digamos, es una tradición que es muy fuerte, ¿no? y finalmente respeto a las elecciones, ¿no? eh, que digamos ha, eh, que ha sido una larga tradición, ¿no? eh, pero es cierto, al mismo tiempo el sistema eh, ha generado eh, violencia de todo tipo, digamos, con mucha discusión, digamos, de las causas efectivas de la violencia. Digamos, yo creo que en la literatura colombiana donde tenemos un, eh, el máximo número de lo que en la jerga colombiana llamamos los violentólogos, o sea, los que escriben sobre la violencia. Yo creo que es el único país en el mundo que tiene, la que tiene un periodo de su historia que se llama la violencia. Pues, los violentólogos no eh, de... han discutido mucho, digamos, eh, y hay, hay problemas de exclusión, muchos problemas de exclusión a nivel local más que nacional. Eh, pero también es muy claro, de acuerdo con toda esa literatura, que el problema del narcotráfico fue lo que agravó el problema de la violencia. Eh, o sea, es una constante, digamos, es una confusión de toda esa literatura. Al mismo tiempo que no hay, no hay mucha evidencia, por ejemplo, de que está asociada eh, a los niveles de pobreza regionales. Digamos, es un tema, digo, es, hay literatura a la sobre el tema de la violencia en Colombia, digamos, la violentología, es, una, es toda una rama de las ciencias sociales en Colombia, eh, digamos que ha sido muy fructífera en sus, eh, en sus trabajos, hay gente del primer nivel. O sea, eh, digamos, hay un problema eh, serio, digamos. Eh, ahora, eh, eh, para mí el problema digamos, de Colombia es si absorber, si logramos si logra superar el problema. En cambio, el problema venezolano finalmente digamos, es volver a un sistema republicano estable. Eh, con una característica que, eh, que ahora, eh, digamos, con el grado de polarización, no se ve por dónde va a salir, ¿no? Que es la, digamos, eh, para ponerlo de alguna manera, el, eh, la, la, la oposición actual, eh, eh, ahora obviamente en control del Congreso, va a tener que aprender que el chavismo es un movimiento político estable e importante en Venezuela y tiene que darle espacio para que ello subsista. ¿No es cierto? Es, 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 ¿Qué? Es el peronismo. De... Es el peronismo, es el peronismo. La, 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 el peronismo es un poco diferente porque el peronismo, como decía Perón, peronistamos todos, ¿no? Eso era, era que ha habido peronismo de derecha, de izquierda, de todas las variantes posibles del peronismo, ¿no? Pero digamos, eh, allá va a tener un, eh, un chavismo. Dale tiempo al chavismo. <risa> va a tener un chavismo estable, ¿no es cierto? Entonces, ¿cómo lo absorbe el sistema político? Eh, es, una, es una cuestión importante. Más aún, yo creo que la, eh, digamos, la, la propia eh, oposición o ahora el del poder en el Congreso eh, tendrá que ver cómo, pues, cómo se depura políticamente. ¿no? Es una cantidad de movimientos heterogéneos, eh, digamos, sin claros, eh, sin claros liderazgos. O sea, no es el sistema anterior eh, de ustedes que, que tenían pues, dos grandes partidos, ¿no? Eh, en Colombia, Colombia, el dicho sea de Pau, también eh, se ha vuelto más heterogéneo en ese sentido, ¿no? porque Colombia tenía eh, dos grandes partidos y hoy en día tiene, digamos, eh, por lo menos cinco. ¿no? <risa> Uno depende cómo los cuente, pero <risa> cinco o seis, ¿no? Eh, es, es mucho más eh, compleja esa situación. ¿no? Pero digamos, eh, esa es parte, digamos, como. Ahora, como digo, es sorprendente, de todas maneras, si sí, lo decía yo que Venezuela no está ya en violencia. O sea, es, es, es realmente una, es una solidez, digamos, en Colombia esta situación 
que es en Venezuela, lo hubiera estallado hace rato en múltiples formas adicionales de violencia. Eh, Ahora, curiosamente, eh, digamos, yo, yo creo que la, eh, la curiosa tradición de violencia de Colombia, que es curiosa digamos, a nivel internacional por su perdurabilidad, eh, eh, es, es también parte de una, una, una tendencia muy curiosa a, a, a la debilidad del poder central. Eh, que Venezuela nunca ha tenido, que prácticamente, o, o qué sé yo, hay otros países que nunca han tenido, digamos, en otros países de Venezuela. El, el, eh, de alguna manera, el, el, la, digamos, estas instituciones colombianas también tienen como una peculiaridad de que Colombia nunca tuvo, quiso tener un ejército fuerte, históricamente, hasta que lo tomó. O sea, Colombia nunca, o sea, el acuerdo de las élites regionales del siglo XIX era un ejército ley. ¿Por qué? Porque no quería ser controlada por Bogotá. ¿no? Eh, eh, en cambio, Venezuela, digamos, a través de todos estos caudillos y, y gobiernos militares, eh, desarrolla un ejército muy fuerte, digamos, ¿no? eh, que obviamente digamos, logra estabilizar. Eh, dicho sea de paso, Ecuador también eh, digamos, logra estabilizar un, 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 un ejército fuerte. Colombia no. Colombia es un ejército débil. Digamos, el ejército se, eh, se institucionaliza solamente con Rojas Espinilla a mediados del siglo XX. Uh, y aún así continúa siendo eh, un ejército débil. El ejército colombiano se vuelve fuerte eh, es, eh, en los 90 y 2000, o sea, en los últimos 25 años, por la necesidad de la violencia, digamos, de combatir la violencia. Pero antes no, no, no tenemos la tradición. Entonces, eso, eh, curiosa, históricamente permite unos grados de, de insubordinación de la periferia, digamos, eh, muy grandes y que no están controlados por Bogotá. ¿no? Eso es un tema eh, digamos, que es interesante, peculiar, digamos, muy peculiar. Digamos, ¿no? no se da en ningún otro país eh, eh, latinoamericano, ciertamente. ¿no? Y al final, pues, ¿no? bueno, ¿Todos hablan español? Sí, ¿Sí? ya estamos en español. Okay, <risa> eh, bueno, eh, soy Felipe Ramos, estoy justo llegando a, a Nueva York para mi doctorado en la New School sobre Venezuela y estaba viviendo justo en Caracas en los últimos cuatro años trabajando para el gobierno brasileño ya, ¿no? intentando hacer cooperación, desarrollar proyectos de cooperación bilateral entre Brasil y Venezuela y bueno, ha sido muy difícil todo eh, los últimos dos años allá y hemos venido viendo esa, ese, ese deterioro ¿no? de, de Venezuela eh, yo quería ya traer un poquito más justo para el presente, ¿no? después de esa mirada histórica y es, yo manejo algunos números que no sé si son los mismos de que ustedes tienen, pero eh, este año Venezuela tiene alrededor de 10 mil millones eh, de pagos en, en bonos, 6,2 eh, pa, solamente para los préstamos de China, lo que llega ahí a alrededor de 16,3 de pagos que de, se deben hacer este año. ¿no? Y en recetas uh, del petróleo debe llegar cerca de 17,7, lo que sería como 1,4 eh, solamente de importaciones de un país que ahora importa básicamente todo. ¿eh? Eh, entonces Venezuela está ahí frente a, un, a una paradoja muy grande que es paga oh, las deudas eh, con el miedo de, de esa cuestión de los activos que tiene aquí en Estados Unidos, los navíos de PDVSA, etc. Uh, o eh, pagando, dejando de importar el, 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 los niveles de escasez que yo ya había visto ya en el último año, que había sido altísimos, ese año sería algo increíble. Estamos hablando de que al interior del país, porque Caracas es la vitrina, uno llega en Caracas y ya ve las colas en la, los supermercados. Eh, pero al interior del país la situación ya es alarmante y ya hay violencia aunque una violencia que el gobierno funciona como un, bom un bombero y va inmediatamente para eh, quitar ese, ese fuego ¿no? como dijo Maduro en las protestas de 2014 que hay candela que se prende, candela que se, que se apaga eh, eso, eso está pasando en Venezuela ya al interior del país ya hay saqueos, ya hay eh, casos relatados de, de, de reportados de violencia, etc. Entonces estamos ahí, hoy mismo la oposición venezolana ha anunciado ya sus mecanismos de transición, ¿eh? está ahí en la, los periódicos de hoy en Venezuela. Eh, entonces estamos en una situación que yo pienso que estamos llegando al límite, tanto, tanto política como económicamente en Venezuela. Estamos discutiendo eso junto al gobierno de Brasil, incluso junto a, a, 
también tu paisano eh, Samper en UNASUR eh, con el tema de, eh, de la posibilidad incluso de una crisis humanitaria eh, si llegamos al límite y los actores no llegan a un acuerdo de, de transición en el país eh, entonces cómo tú ves esa situación tanto política y económica eh, para este año y estos esfuerzos que están empezando incluso a nivel internacional de llegar a un acuerdo sobre Venezuela, incluso ya la discusión sobre un bailout de, um, del FMI. Bueno, el bailout del FMI no ocurrirá. Eh, no me suena a la seguridad del FMI, salvo que hay un cambio radical de gobierno. Eh, Pero considerando es, es, más, es más posible un bailout de China que el Fondo Monetario del caso de Venezuela. Entonces, digamos que es una, una digamos, Venezuela ha recibido más o menos la mitad de los préstamos chinos, ¿no? Entonces, eh, digamos, China es un actor importante en la crisis de deuda venezolana. ¿En qué orden de la actitud del gobierno de Guadalajara? ¿Se puede entender? Eh, estamos hablando de 50, 60 mil millones de dólares de deuda de venezolana con China. Es, es todo lo que pasa es que todo tiene la forma de, de, de compra anticipada de petróleo. Entonces, eh, entonces a, digamos, hay que ver digamos, cómo se desenvuelve situación, o sea, yo eh, eh, digamos, digamos, yo no, no estoy dentro de la mecánica, digamos, de entender, de, de ver cuál es digamos, si me sienta a mí a ver la, la política económica venezolana y qué hacer eh, podría decir algo más eh, razonable, ¿no? Eh, pero bueno, ahora eh, curiosamente, con, eh, yo me reúno, yo de vez en cuando hablo con un par de personas que, que siguen muy bien Venezuela eh, que son, eh, digamos, con los cuales yo hablo periódicamente, que son eh, Francisco Rodríguez, que está en el eh, y uh, es un gran economista, muy enterado. Eh, eh, y, y, y curiosamente, y con Marco Weisbrot, ¿no es cierto?, que es de este centro de, 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 de izquierda de Washington, que es muy cercano al gobierno y que escribe regularmente eh, sobre Venezuela. Eh, y a, a mí, me, dicho sea de paso, me. Con ambos he hablado eh, sobre este tema, digamos, eh, desde hace meses, y ambos estamos de acuerdo en que lo primero que hay que hacer es liberar el mercado cambiario. Eh, o sea, dejar flotar el tipo de cambio al, a lo que sea. Digamos, eh, esa es una de las... Eh, eh, curiosamente, Mark Weisberg acaba, acaba de publicar hace pocos días en The, en The Guardian una columna diciendo exactamente eso, que yo dije que se iba a reservar por un tiempo, pero ya digo, eh, digamos esto después de ser vendido del fracaso de las medidas que, que adoptó el gobierno el mes pasado. ¿no? O sea que, digamos, el, 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 el sistema cambiario venezolano es, es fuente de... O sea, no sabemos cuál es la magnitud del problema cambiario simplemente porque está tan distorsionado el mercado cambiario eh, y hay tanta corrupción que se ha armado en torno al mercado cambiario. Digamos, consiguiendo dólares eh, a tasas absurdamente bajas para venderla a tasas que son absolutamente altas. Como que la diferencia, el diferencial entre el tipo de cambio libre y el tipo de cambio oficial, pues ha tocado 100 veces, ¿no? más o menos. Entonces, era un número que yo, yo no lo veía. El único otro país donde eh, se han visto números tan altos como los de Venezuela es en Cuba. Pero en Cuba con un sistema totalmente controlado. <risa> eh, en Venezuela es un mercado libre, ¿no? Eh, el, el mercado eh, cambiario, ¿no? Libre. Pues negro, digamos, ¿no? Entonces, eh, yo creo que eso es, es un punto de partida. Yo, yo francamente, desde hace mucho rato pienso que lo mejor puede ser es eliminar controles de cambio, eliminar controles de precios y subsidiar alimentos. Digamos, como... Eh, y veo que en parte eso era parte de, la, de lo que estaba detrás de las medidas de... de ahora tienen que volver a una, de, a una política monetaria eh, muy rigurosa, ¿no? niveles de inflación y posiblemente tienen que hacer un, un acuerdo de ingresos y salarios porque, para poder estabilizar la inflación, pero no eso solamente es posible con algún grado de, 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 de armonía política ¿no? digamos, pero digamos, la, digamos, los niveles de inflación ya son entonces eso eh, uno tiene que hacer pues como, eh, de hecho hay muchas experiencias latinoamericanas eh, de ese tipo del pasado que se pueden utilizar como eh, algunas eh, algunas fallidas que observo, eh, que yo, el, el plan de los planes brasileños, los planes argentinos, eh, el plan mexicano que de hecho fue el más exitoso de los, de los años eh, 80, ¿no? 
estabilización de la inflación con política de ingresos y salarios. ¿no? Eh, con, y ya, y tal, un grado de control de precios más razonable. Pero digamos, el, el, yo creo que el sistema de control eh, entró en total ineficacia en, en el caso venezolano y, y, y genera más problemas. Una vez hay eso, no sé, eh, ahora, eh, una cosa que, que o sea, hay que ver todavía es cuáles son los activos externos que tiene Venezuela. Uh -huh. Eh, o sea, por ahora, digamos, la medición del gobierno es seguir pagando la deuda, así lo ha demostrado en varias decisiones recientes. ¿no? Eh, entonces, eh, pues, contra la opinión de algunos economistas ilustres como Ricardo Haberman, que viene diciendo hace más de un año que, 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 que eso es, es una moratoria de la deuda. ¿no? Pero hasta ahora no, eh, no ha, el gobierno no ha optado por, por eso. Ahora, hay muchos activos eh, internacionales de Venezuela. Veo que eh, uno de ellos, que, es, que eran las reservas de oro, las han venido vendiendo, no sé, hasta que, no sé cuánto queda, eh, porque gran parte de las reservas internacionales están en oro, eh, ya han vendido creo que gran parte de oro, eh, pero también están todas las inversiones de PDVSA en el exterior, que veo que están desmantelando y también están vendiendo. ¿no? Entonces, ¿cuántos son esos? Eso aquí yo, yo prácticamente no sé. Por ejemplo, Francisco Rodríguez dice que Venezuela tiene los activos suficientes para, para enfrentar la crisis eh, sin suspensión de pagos. No, no. no sé, pues, la última vez que me comentó decía ahora es que tiene otro activo. ¿Eh? Entonces, eh, Venezuela tiene muchos activos en el exterior. Eh, o sea, en fin. Más aún, digamos, si uno hiciera una estabilización cambiaria, yo estoy seguro que hay muchos recursos en el exterior de privados que volverían a Venezuela. Entonces, no, bueno, o sea, eh, ahora, eh, las medidas que adoptó el gobierno el mes pasado eh, son muy tibias en esa dirección.